same partner, which when you're in law basically says, you know, you know you do it, you've done it before, you keep doing it. It's hardly just this this burst of anger that, you know, a rage that was out of your control. Seventy five percent of intimate partner femicides reviewed in a recent study were preceded by one or more incidents of stalking when, within a year of the crime. And in this state, stalking is under the Family Violence Act, or laws, so they, they tend to look at it as a crime against, in, a domestic violence crime. In my case, we weren't in a relationship, but in, with stalking, even for me, my stalker tried to find me on the web last year after he'd been convicted. I get one of those, like, my life alerts, you know, people are looking for you, and there's two people on it. One was the woman trying to do my, my uh, class reunion, and the other was him. <laughs> and, it, and when you look at the different internet sites about domestic violence, one of the warnings I'll give you is your people who stalk, people who are trying to find you, are very high tech now. They can find you using GPS, they can find you um, by cell phones, they can find you on the internet by tracking your history. They will, they will, they have so many resources now to figure out mm -hmm. where you are. And a good exercise is to go to some of the search engines that gather information about you and do a search on yourself to see how much they can actually find. Um, if you go to some of the national sites on sexual assault or domestic violence, there even be a warning to turn off your, you know, turn off your computer, erase your history, which is near impossible to do actually, and and use the phone instead of searching on the internet, which is rather scary because not everybody is technically savvy to to understand that how high tech the problem has gotten. If someone wants to find you, oh yeah. What do you do? As a, as a, or what will you be doing as an art therapist to help women heal from, from their experiences? Um, <clears throat> art therapy is, as, is, let's start over. <laughs> art therapy as a whole is healing through art, using art as therapy instead of communicating. Um, I would be using um, various techniques um, that are very simple to learn, um, but also... Oh, oh, there's my art. Um, as you can see, it's a lot of collage, very simple to do stencils, markers, crayons, tissue paper, um, markers, pens, whatever you can get a hold of, you can make art with. Now, in your art, I see a lot of images of women. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of images of women, um, kind of like a, a mix of the dark side and the few, and the hope. You, you, your stuff is a lot about hope these days. I've noticed. Yes. You know, looking um, forward instead of looking back. Like that's one where I love that image of you know, very intimate. You know, she's not clothed. She's. You know, it up to the interpreter of whether she's happy or sad, but then the butterflies and the umbrellas and the protective things around her. It's beautiful. Thank you. I, um, I like to send messages of hope. I think that's really important. When I was going through my toughest times, I would have messages of hope pasted throughout my entire house because the more you read it, the more you believe it. We want it all. There is kind of a feeling that that you're not allowed to want the world to change when you're in that situation. I can't really read that. Those are beautiful. And you have very bright, vibrant colors. There's nothing hiding in your art. No, it's I not don't. subtle. They remind me of tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> I love bright, vibrant colors. I think the world should be alive. I think art should pop. I think mm -hmm. just you can look at it and feel it instead of a black and white image or dull colors. Um, Which is a pro when we are in these situations, at least for me, as Megan was sing singing, you're in a dark spot. You're in darkness of the soul. You're in, you're in 
you, you just kind of erase all feelings and emotions and shove it into some corner of your world. And you're not allowed to feel that. Right. So bright colors are like the opposite. It's just, you know, wow, here I am. And, and you know, it's expressive and it's, and it's reaching out to other people with this art instead of quietly hanging on the wall in some subtle little, you know, corner, corner with calligraphy and that, you know, it's, it, it, it asked the person admiring the art to share that experience of the color and the emotion and the, and the images and, and interpret as they will. It's beautiful. And I would think that it's something that other non-artists could easily enjoy in your therapy. I try to create very non-invasive art um, with my collage, especially. It's art that, in, for the non-artist to be use it as therapy as well. Um, anybody can pick up a magazine and clip out some images and some words that they like and put them on a canvas. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it could, like vision boards are a perfect example that everyone's doing. <laughs> But I think they're great because it gives something. It gives you something to look forward to. Um, it could give you hope and joy. Or on the flip side, if you're really feeling depressed about yourself, um, it's another outlet for you. Instead of being self-defeatist mm -hmm. and allowing it to um, hinder your self-esteem, you can make art. And even if it's morbid art or depressing art it's mm -hmm. still art and you're still creating and you're getting it out of your your body right purging how do you, how do you find the the jewelry because your jewelry is it's that's more detailed and fine and and you're working focusing so hard right when you do jewelry do you find it relaxing or are you are oh you yeah I, I i love it you know and then i you know i go out so many times a year and set up and, and I sell my jewelry because I, I get it real, I, I try to buy it real cheap and then things need to be fixed and stuff like that. And uh, when you do jewelry, I know uh, uh, of the people that I know that make jewelry, there's a lot of selecting of little bits. It's like it's like almost like going to the beach and finding shells on the beach because there's so many yeah, different I, things. I you, call it you, my treasury, my treasure. <laughs> <laughs> but then you take all that, you put it together into this beautiful piece, and then you sell it. Right. And then it's gone. Does replace that replace it? You, you just replace it. It doesn't bother you at all. When did you start the jewelry? Well, some of my special pieces and stuff. If I see somebody pick it up, I'll say, oh, that's, you know, $35. Right <laughs> <now."> <laughs> oh, yeah, no problem. I don't want to, you know what I mean? It's right. like I don't want to sell it. Yeah. But I've gotten past that, and I to let go. Let it go. Let, let everything go. How long did it take to you to get to the place where you could be creative and let things go? And took a relax? long time. How did you get there? You know, I had to have I had to have all my uh, things, my material things, my uh, you know, my little men, mm -hmm. <laughs> my little toys, mm -hmm. everything. It, it's it, it, that's not easy to do. Yeah, I know. When I first started writing poetry, I for the longest time, for years actually, up until maybe the last decade, I didn't keep any of it. I wrote it and destroyed it because a lot of it was venting and a lot of it was about my experiences and a lot of it was very hostile and very angry or very exposing, you know, intimate details that I would never want anybody to know. It's almost like if you have a the stomach flu, the first thing you do is shut the bathroom door. <laughs> you just don't want people to see. And, and I just couldn't reveal that part. I mean, I didn't want it preserved. So it would either, I would either throw it away or I would, if I wrote it for something specific for somebody, I would give it to them and I'd never keep a copy. I just, it had to go and I wasn't going to own it and I wasn't going to feel it and I wasn't going to publicly celebrate that I'd done something, even if it was fantastic, it was gone, you know. And part of that is, is just this long-term dis disability to connect with people and, and things from from just such a long history of abuse that I know I've moved so many times 
and started over so many times. 